one of the things I have been interested in since I was in my uh, 30s was, well, and I, you already know this story, and I'll just say it quick. Um, I'm interested in a lot of things, but one of the things that I'm really interested in is the Kennedy assassination. A lot of reasons I can tell you, and I know you know this, but my yeah. mother, I could call her up right now and say, Kennedy, and she will start crying. Very emotional for her. Yeah, yeah. She was 21. You know, she loved him. And um, she was anyways, what? How old? I, I'm sorry, go ahead. You gave me a rage. You said she was what? She was 31? She was 21 when he was 21. killed. Oh, wow. I was alive, but I was in her womb. So I was <laughs> two, two months away. And I read an account somewhere that talked about this notion, but I do feel like, I, I mean, I was alive. I was alive as, an, as a human entity. And I do feel like connected to that event because I know my mom cried for many, many weeks. Yeah. And that had to have an impact on me. Sure. And, um, but anyways, I thought nothing of <clears throat> the Kennedy assassination. I went to school and I read the book, Lee Harvey Oswald shot Kennedy, end of story. Until 1985, when I was sitting in my college, uh, our little, our house, and my friend, Craig, I'll just use his first name, was reading your small, pop, I'll call it the paperback or pocket the paperback book. edition. Yeah, the paperback edition is real thick. And he's reading Best Evidence. And, I, and he was telling me about the head snap, the grassy knoll assassin. I'm like, what are you talking about? And I was a history major. So I'm embarrassed to say I knew nothing about that. So they don't teach it. They don't, I don't know what they're doing today, but it's a shame if they don't teach the alternative interpretation of the Oh evidence. no, they do not. Um, and fast forward to about 1990, and I had a student at a um, school I was working at as a social studies teacher. I remember her face. I remember her talking to me. And I just can't remember her name, which is fine. But she came up to me and said, oh, my God, Mr. Hoffman, have you seen this book? And it was Best Evidence. And I said, no. And, and I, well, I said, I kind of remember because of the college days, but I won't get into why I didn't remember much in my college days. But she was telling me, oh, yeah, I'm going tonight to Chicago to meet the author, David Lifton. And I'm going to hopefully get a picture with him. And as I recall, she showed me that picture the next day and she got to meet you and stuff. Well, that's neat. Because of that student, uh, I went out and I bought Best Evidence, and then it's, it's never ended ever since. Yeah. And I read the book, I've read it at least two or three times, and I've, I've done more than just read it. I studied it, and I've, I, I teach the basic principles from it. And because of that book, I ended up, I read, every book I could get my hand on just to be able to say I'm open-minded about this. I'm not narrow-minded. Right. But let me just list a couple of books that I've read uh, to the audience. And I'm sure you know a lot of these guys. <clears throat> but for example, I went out, the second book I bought was Rush to Judgment by Mark Lane. I then, and now this would be around 1992-93 when, when Oliver Stone's film came out. Yeah, and um, I read High Treason by Robert Grodin. I read yeah, yeah, right. Go ahead. yeah. I read Plausible Denial by Mark Lane. I read, of course, On the Trail of the Assassins by Jim Garrison. And as you said, you told me before you met Garrison and worked with Garrison. Yes, I, mean, I met him. Oh, I spent an evening with him. Yeah, at least okay. once. I read, and I think you know. I don't know how you feel about this, but I read what I thought was an important book by Colonel L. Fletcher Prouty. JFK, the CIA, Vietnam, and the plot to assassinate President Kennedy. I felt that was an important book for various reasons. One being, he talked about how the Pentagon was connected to that. And then, of course, uh, you know, you left, I, you left out you left out six seconds in Dallas. You know what? That's one book I haven't read. Of course, that's one of the most important books. And that's also, it was an important book on the on my. It was an important book. I think. Um, We've gone beyond that with best evidence, but yes, it was an important book. And wasn't Epstein's book as well, would you say? Uh, yes, Epstein's book. The two, the, what happened was the Warren re Report was published in September 64, and, the first, and then came the 26 volumes of the Warren Commission in November 64, 
And then the first, what we call the books about the Kennedy assassination, in my thinking, begin in July 1966 with Epstein's inquest, and then two months later, Mark Lane's rush to judgment. And, and I will admit, I did not read the whole thing, but I read most of the uh, the summary of the Warren report. I did yeah. not. I know you read every volume, probably. Of you know, the yeah, it's like it's, it's like buying a set of encyclopedias. Yeah. Uh, and yes, I have read most of them because uh, once I made the discoveries that I did, that there was photographic evidence of assassins firing from the front, which I believed I could see with my own eyes and some of the enlargements. Then I bought the 26 volumes and uh, you know how, uh, but well, let's not leave out the most important, um, uh, most important event, which was I was at UCLA and I met this law professor who had been on the Warren Commission. And he and I struck up a relationship and I made regular meetings and visits to his office and, and uh, basically he was my dialogue opponent. He asked me to attend his class, but then in October, 1966, when I had known him about a year and a year and a half, I make this whopping discovery that uh, pr really is the, is the solution to the crime, which is that the president's body was altered. I mean, anybody who watches Law and Order understands the importance of the autopsy in any murder. The autopsy is a, description of the body at the time um, uh, after the death, and it describes the wounds and the cause of death and all that. By basically deconstructing the body, opening it up, finding the bullets and all that. Um, the, the notion that you could have a conspiracy in which the autopsy report was falsified uh, sounds a, a little bit weird, if not impossible, because you'd have to recruit all these people connected with the thing. But, but the fact is, instead of um, instead of um, falsifying the autopsy report, this crime was uh, engineered on the uh, idea of falsifying the foundation for the autopsy report. That is, what were these people examining at autopsy? The body of the president. So somebody had the bright idea that if we kill the president and we want to falsify the autopsy, we don't have to go and recruit all these doctors. You just have to get to the body, take the bullets out, mess with the wounds, which renders the body a medical forgery and then send it to the autopsy room. And then the doctors there, if they believe what they're saying, will be honest and they've been deceived by an altered body. That's what best evidence is all about. Yeah, how that was done. That's, essential. I'm sorry, go ahead. That best evidence was based on the idea, my discovery, that President Kennedy's body was altered in the five hour period between the time of the shooting at 12.30 p.m. Central Standard Time in Dallas, and the time the autopsy was conducted at eight o'clock at the United States Naval Hospital at Bethesda, Maryland. In between those two points in time, President's body was, you know, he's pronounced dead. He was rushed to the hospital after the shooting, pronounced dead. Then the body was placed in a coffin. That coffin was brought out to, to Love Field in Dallas, placed aboard Air Force One. Then the nation was, you know, Walter Cronkite, everybody was commenting on what happened in Dallas. There were wire service reports. Plane lands at six o'clock. The whole nation watches as the coffin is put on a forklift or a, a mechanical um, lift and yeah. is lowered from the rear entrance of Air Force One down to the ground level. Um, and on that lift is Jacqueline Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy and is placed into an AV ambulance which went to Bethesda Naval Hospital where the autopsy began at eight. So this is like a, ma a magician's trick. I discovered the evidence that between those two points in time, when the murder occurred, you know, and the observations at Parkland Hospital and the time of the Bethesda autopsy, five and a half hours later, somebody altered the body. The bullets were removed and the, uh, there was surgery. And by that surgery, I don't mean clinical surgery, life-saving surgery. It was what they call pathological surgery, surgery, the surgery done during an autopsy to remove the top of the head, take out the brain, and all this other stuff that most people see in a movie today. Um, and that's what was done in that period. And, and that's where my story starts, where I understood that something happened to the body in that period. I discovered the FBI report that says that when the body was taken out of the coffin at Bethesda Naval Hospital, it was, quote, apparent 
that there had been surgery of the head area, namely in the top of the skull. And that's where my story begins. I brought that to Professor Liebler at UCLA, uh, who I'd now known a year and a half, and we were arguing about what this evidence meant about the head snap and the smoke on the grassy knoll. And he was just blown away because he was astounded. Two things. First of all, that I made the discovery at all. But second of all, that there in the public record was in an FBI report was evidence of post-mortem illegal surgery to the body of Kennedy prior to the autopsy. You told me, um, I got a couple questions real quick. Sure. He was, he kept saying to you, but David, there's no evidence of that. And so when you brought this to him, evidence of a something other than Oswald shot him, that, that helped to add to the fact he was astounded because here you're showing him actual evidence that the body was altered. Is, yeah, is that well, correct or? Uh, well, uh, it, let, let, let me be specific here. Um, what happened during our year and a half relationship before I made the discovery <clears throat> was we went back and forth on the evidence of whether Oswald acted alone or whether he was even involved at all. And what happened is that, um, is that Liebler and I were walking down a path together, you might say, and he got interested just like I was. I was quite quoting the autopsy report to show that the, the wounds um, must have been altered or something. And he was also looking at the same thing. And there was this conundrum. How could this happen? How could this have happened? And then there I made the discovery in an FBI report that the FBI said that there had been surgery of the head area. And that's what blew him away. Not just the concept that had been done. Sometimes I think that he may have even conceived of it before I did. That was part of the puzzle or the discovery. The other part was that it was in the public record. Mm -hmm. This FBI report had been released a year before and was at the National Archives. And there it was buried in a sentence in the third page of the report written by the two FBI agents who attended the autopsy, that when the body was taken out of the coffin at the Bethesda end of the line, it was quote apparent there had been surgery to the head area. Head area. What the hell did that mean? I. I called up the FBI agent who wrote that report almost immediately, as soon as I read it, in the, within a couple of weeks, November 1966. I read it to him, and um, he said he couldn't comment on it because of, you know, the Bureau's regulations, but he said, and this was unforgettable and it's in my book, he said the report stands. He stood behind that report. Yes. So then the question is, well, what did it mean? And then within a month, and skipping a lot of detail here, I learned what it meant, that the report was written based on the FBI agents taking notes in the autopsy room at the time the coffin was opened, and that it represented what the lawyers would call an oral utterance. In other words, if you say something and I'm making notes, then I write a report about it, I'm recording in a report your oral utterances. Of course, if I had a tape recorder, it would be a perfect transcript. Anyway, um, that's what happened. These FBI agents, not understanding what it meant, yeah. made notes that when the body was taken out of the coffin, it was, quote, apparent that there was surgery in the head area. And it turns out that the reason they wrote those things was because the chief autopsy surgeon, who was right there and conducting the examination, said it. And so then I called up this, the autopsy surgeon, and that's a chapter. That's all in best evidence. And... Um, and I read it to him, and he was astounded. He, he was astounded because he didn't know it was in the record. And I said, well, what are you going to say when there's a new investigation? And he said, I don't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> wow. Wow. Let me say this. Um, you spent a lot of time and money interviewing key witnesses to support your contentions and your, your uh, theories and the facts that you present in Best Evidence. And I'm going to put a link in the video uh, down below to best evidence, the research video. Correct. That is fascinating. I used to use that in the classroom. True. That is fascinating uh, to watch these. You, you, through them, you show how the body was altered from point A, Dallas, to point B, Bethesda Naval Hospital. I will add too, correct me if I'm wrong, the, when the coffin came off the plane uh, in your book, which blew me away, that coffin was actually empty. Yeah, and by that time, the crime of altering the body or that by that time the people involved in this affair had gotten hold of the body and i can prove that the body was not in that coffin because it arrived at bethesda 
uh, an hour, whatever it was, an hour, 20 minutes later, it arrived 20 minutes before the coffin. So if you had a camera positioned at Bethesda Naval Hospital, first would arrive a black hearse with some men in plain clothes who quickly run into the room <laughs> with a shipping oh. casket. That's the body entering Bethesda Naval Hospital. Then 20, um, 20 minutes later, the Navy ambulance coming from Andrews Air Force Base drives up with Jackie Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy next to the big Dallas coffin, which unknown to them is empty. So yeah, I made a timeline. And, huh? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So I made a timeline and showed what was going on here, that somehow the body had been removed from the casket prior to the takeoff of Air Force One in Dallas. And, and, and uh, so to make it uh, this point of distinction, the men in plain clothes were carrying a sh cheap shipping casket that you chip yeah. a body in. And when Jackie came, she had a $10,000 ornamental casket. That's right. Totally because, different. Yeah, so, totally different casket. Totally different. So yeah. I'd, like to, um, I'd like to just say this to the audience, that if you haven't ever read a book about the Kennedy assassination and you're interested, absolutely start with Best Evidence and then go from there. If you've read different books, but you haven't read Best Evidence, you must read it. It's the linchpin. That's the most important book. And I know Mr. Lipton's here with me, and I'm not trying to blow smoke. I'm telling you, I've read all these different books. This is the one book that has not been refuted. This is the linchpin of the whole thing. Also, I will add, I'm a kind of a fan of Joe Rogan. He has millions of fans. And he says it on, with Oliver Stone. They both say they've read the book and they were blown away. Joe Rogan says that. So you well, you know, I think I, I like to add one thing here. For anybody who's watching it, who is a student of science or engineering, uh, will we'll find it an easier read than those who are not. Because in science and in physics or engineering, they, they have a, what they call before and after situations. So you have what they, the professor's up there and here's a black box and he draws it on the blackboard. Now I put a signal in at the input end and something else comes out at the output end. And what happens in between to turn the original signal into the different signal, okay? That's what I call a before and after situation. And it occurs in physics when two particles collide and they say, well, here's before there were these two particles and then they collided and then you get this rainbow effect, you know, whatever you have. And they compare the before and the after. This whole business with the body struck me as relatively easy to understand because it was simply another before and after situation. Only instead of a black box with an electronic signal, it's the flesh and bones of the president of the United States. The wound started out this way. And then at this later point in time, there was another way. And so it was a before and after and kind of like I was a detective out there looking for the transfer function. And you can say, well, you were just looking for evidence of body alteration, and that's true. But it, the analogy to what I learned in engineering and specifically in engineering physics was absolutely applicable point by point because conceptually, this was a before and after situation uh, on the, presidents of the, the body of the President of the United States. Okay. So let's go to January 1981, Best Evidence was published. Okay. It was on the New York Times bestselling list for something like nine Three weeks. Months. Three months. Three months. Um, it had been published by four separate publishers. Now, the importance of the Carol and Graff edition wow. was that's when um, I had obtained the autopsy photographs. That's the one. And I, and I published them as an appendix and then wrote about how I got a hold of them, which is an interesting story. I don't know if we have time for it here, but that's all. The, and that's what blew people away. So now I had a whole second audience. The first audience, I am sure, in 81, was uh, interested in, if not fascinated by the idea that there had been what they call a strategic deception executed in Dallas on November 22nd. A strategic deception is much more involved than simply saying, oh, there was a second assassin. It's the falsification of the entire appearance of the crime at the time, and then the record left behind. And they did that by focusing on the body. Then I come along and get these pictures years later. I included them in the Carol and Graff edition, and that got me a whole new generation of readers who now could look at the pictures at the back. And, and, and also the advent of the internet cannot be ignored. That was um, roughly 1994 or five, when for the first time, 
instead of arguing with your neighbor about this or somebody you knew at a coffee shop, it's worldwide. And so there are discussion groups and it's, it's all over the internet, discussions about this issue. When I was at, um, I want to get to Spinal Charade, your next book, but before that, just quick comment. When I was at Wabonzi Valley High School in Aurora from 86 to 1995, yeah. every, every year with another teacher, a guy named Mark, um, 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 I forget his last name, I'm sorry, Mark, but he was a trained, he was a trained uh, x-ray technician who worked during the Vietnam War. Yeah. And we would present to literally every, it was always in, in May in honor of President Kennedy's birthday, which is in May, May 29th, but um, 1917. We, I would present the historical evidence using your book, he would present the medical uh, scientific evidence using the pictures from your book. Yeah. And man, we blew those kids away. We would have literally about 150 kids a, an hour all wow. day. Back in those days, they allowed you to do stuff like that. Free thinking, you know, sure. kind of like Berkeley free speech movement. And so we would probably service, you know, 500 kids a year. Wow. We did that for probably five years, six years, something like that. But what I discovered was the essence of the deception was not altering the typewritten autopsy report, but what the report was based on, the body. So the crime of killing Kennedy in situate, um, in consists of killing him, that is putting bullets into his body, and then covertly extracting them prior to the start of the autopsy, by eight o'clock that night. And of course we can get into, and we both have discussed when and where, how did they do this? How did they get access to the body? That's a whole other story. Those are the particulars, but that's the principle of it, that the body was altered prior to autopsy and that lawyers are trained to go with the best evidence and the best evidence in a murder case is the body of the, of the victim. So final charade, you actually, I was shocked, you started it around the time best evidence was published. Is that correct? Um, about, you know, within a, within a year, the, uh, here, yes, a yeah. year, let's, yeah, they took me to dinner, they took, the publisher took me to dinner and said, the book, you know, they loved the book, they were so happy with the commercial success, now we want you to write another one, a sequel, yeah. <coughs> yeah. and I, I didn't, I honestly, I didn't want to, but yeah. they gave me money, and I had to pay the rent, and I said, okay, I guess in the sequel, I'll focus on, and my primary objective in the beginning, was the shooting of Connolly because I had to come up with an explanation for for why his body looked the way it did, and one thing led to another, mm -hmm. and so that's what happened. I ended up, but 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 that, that that you're right. It started within a year, but if I were to type out a chronology of everything that happened since then, about 1990, let's see, uh, when I really got to work on the sequel seriously and the breakthroughs, it's a whole story, another whole story of breakthroughs and insights. And, and yes, so that's, that's gone on for many years. And now we have this book called Final Charade, which, which, is, which doesn't suggest a solution. I think it is the solution to the Kennedy assassination because it tells the full story of Lee Oswald, who he was, how he got involved in this thing. Um, a well-known billionaire whose name I won't, mentioned right here, once had a discussion with me and he said, why, why Oswald? How'd they choose him? How did he get involved? Well, Final Charade has the answer to all of that. You, go, you, have, you have to really understand what's going on with the CIA files and how they got him. And here you have a kid that wants to go to the Soviet Union um, for an, a personal adventure, which he does. And then inst instead of coming back and ending up writing up his manuscript of, about his personal adventure, he ends up getting pre-selected as the assassination patsy in a murder that's gonna take place a, a year and four months later. So that's what happened, that's the tragedy of Oswald. He was a US intelligence agent <clears throat> with a personal agenda to start a career as a writer. And, and, and I'd, like to, into this thing. I'd like to add that at one point, you were pretty close with his widow, Marina Oswald, is that correct? Yes, oh, she used to call me all the time once Best Evidence was published, many, many times, because she understood that best evidence proved that her husband was innocent. She understood that. Yeah. And, she, and she was always, I mean, she was racked with guilt. She turned on the TV and there was Geraldo Rivera or somebody making a joke or it was in the <laughs> culture to make jokes about Oswald as the, 
as the as the um, as the assassin, and she knew her husband loved President Kennedy, right. and so she reached out to me, and we got to know one another. And uh, subsequently, she sat for a filmed interview done by a very competent and well-known cinematographer, and we posted some of those interviews on hard copy, and they are available, I understand, on the internet today. Correct me if I'm wrong. You uh, were there was a movie made about Marina Oswald. And you were in that film as a character, as because you know you were friends with her. Were you yeah. part of the? Did you help write the screenplay for that? I forget the name of the film. What was that film called? Um, I think it was called um, something Deception, Fatal Deception. That's right, Fatal Deception. I remember. So that. what happened was I was approached by a producer in Hollywood who wanted to do a story. He sat down and we talked, and and then I said, look, I'll I'll tell you what I know, but you have to pledge me not to put all of this in your project because then I won't have a book. Right. So we got, to, we got to talking and he wrote the script. And then at some point he said to me, you know, we want to put you in the script. <laughs> so I said, okay. <laughs> so of course it's greatly compressed. You cannot yes. in a 120 page script capture, you know, something that was going on for a decade and a half or something. But yes, yeah. so Maureen is in there and um, it, it's a, uh, it, it captures her angst and you know she had the same problem I had as a researcher in the beginning I mean here's this woman she knows her husband loved President Kennedy and she's in a culture where she turns on the radio and TV every day and he's portrayed as this monster well he wasn't a monster he was a very idealistic American who wanted to be a writer and went to the Soviet Union uh, to have an adventure mm. and uh, uh, you know, I went to Europe the summer he was in Russia in 1961, and we can talk about this sometime, but I had an adventure. I mean, I was in, I was in uh, Berlin the, um, the week after the war went up, and I drove through Checkpoint Charlie and spent an afternoon in... in the, if I'm not mistaken, uh, is that when you tried to fly back and you almost died on a plane crash, or is that a different... No, 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 that's, that's, that's the same trip. Um, I was there, and when I flew back, uh, I was in. I went from Europe into France, Germany, Rome, flew to Israel, spent two weeks in Israel, then had to take my Volkswagen, which I had purchased um, <laughs> at the factory for nine hundred and fifty dollars, wow. and I had to bring it to Paris for shipment back to the United States, where I, for my fr you know, my uh, for the beginning of the fall term of my senior year at Cornell, and I had to get on a charter flight. The flight developed engine trouble over the English Channel. They had to feather the engine, land at Shannon. Ireland and for two days we were there while the engines were fixed and then there were two planes and both both president airlines and they they were fixed and they had a coin toss to decide who would get on the first flight and the coin went up and if I was making a movie I'd show that coin going round and round and landing and it was the other group the German farmers so they all got on the wow. plane and it took off and crashed into the Shannon River and everybody died and that's the that's first um that's on the it's in the New York Times the next day, September 10th, 1961. And then I took the next flight. We all got on the next flight and there was a lot of nervousness, you know. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what uh, happened. Um, so I want to get to bring it up to modern times. You've been working on Final Charade. A couple things. You, uh, I, my partner and I, Robbie uh, Romero, we interviewed you with some students. Yeah, I will I put that. the link to that student film uh, which was uh, which was um, screened in London in July, I believe. Uh, I'm going to put this, the link in the in the in, down below. So anyone that wants to see that student interview of you, it'll be there. Also, um, you have you have a GoFundMe page, yeah. And uh, I would I'm going to put the link there. Uh, you're you're you know you're you're what 81 now. You're you're up yeah. there in years. Uh, you're you're trying to finish your book money's tight you're asking people if they have it in their heart if they would please donate whatever small amount it is uh, and i'll put the link there to donate so you can finish this important research uh, to, uh basically it's it's the really going to be probably in my opinion the last book that's ever going to be written that really will tell us what happened that day now you don't give names but you're going to give the how of this plot but Correct. Most importantly, now, you called me up a couple days ago and you said, my God, this happened to me. I wanted to share this with the audience because it shows that you're, a, even though you're 81, you got all this energy, 
you're, you're still kicking. And what happened to you? Can you tell us the story? Yeah, I was carjacked. And you live in Vegas, right? I live in, right now. I live in Vegas, and yeah, right. I'm living in Vegas. There's a whole reason why. I lived in Dallas for a year, did an oral history with the Six Film Museum, got a lot of work done, and then um, because of personal considerations, my ex-wife um, was wanted to go back to Southern California to be with uh, to be in her life, and I had my reasons for wanting to move to Vegas because of a, a person who was a friend of mine. So I moved to Vegas, and uh, I, I was it was arranged for me to have a nice apartment and I've been working like the Dickens on the book. And when you say working on final charade, it's not always writing chapters. It's doing, continuing the research yeah. on the assassination and figuring out, well, how the hell am I going to tell this part of the story? You've got to turn it into a narrative. It's not enough just to have data. You have to make it a good read. So I'm living here in Vegas and my habit every day, I'm a night person. I go to bed at five in the morning, get up at noon, whatever, one o'clock and I'm working. Well, anyway, I like to get away from here, from the uh, residence. So I go to this diner, and I don't have to mention the name of no, it, but no. or should it? Okay. So anyway, so I'm in the diner. I do my work for three or four hours, and now it's ten o'clock. The waitress says, "You know, David. She knows my name. You know, it's time to go. We're closing up." So I get in my car, I leave with my computer bag, and uh, I have my my laptop, the one I'm looking at right now, and I uh, get into the car. And um, it's, it's, it's about 10.05. I just did a chronology on this earlier today. And I get into the car to make a phone call to a friend. We talk for about 25 minutes. And I said, okay, speak to you tomorrow. See ya. And then I started the engine and drove the five minutes back to the gated community where I live. I live inside a gated community. Mm -hmm. So I pull up, punch the digital code into the little device the gate raises. And I drive my car through to my assigned parking place. So now I'm a parking in an assigned place, like, you know, let's say space hundred and, you know, 375, whatever. I pull into my, into my space, cut the engine, get out of the car with my computer in my left hand, the bag, and the car keys in my right hand. And uh, as I walk away from the car, there were these three guys. I noticed them when I pulled in. They looked like the residents there. You know, I just thought they were residents. But now... He, one of them is facing me and he has a drawn gun and he's facing me with this nine millimeter Glock. I'm looking right down the barrel of a Glock and he says, I want oh your God. car keys. So um, I had to give him my car keys because it was a simple choice. I mean, if I tried to argue about it, I'd be dead. Then he says, I want you to lie down on the ground right here, the asphalt. And then his, 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 there were three of them. And while I was lying down on the asphalt and the other guy had, he had the gun still on me, um, one of his associates put a paper mask over my license plate. So it made it impossible to identify my car by its license plate because they put on fake alphanumeric numbers mm -hmm. pasted across my mm -hmm. license plate. And then um, they uh, got into the car and, uh, and the last thing he shouted some threat, you stay lying on the ground, you know, implying that I'd get hurt if I tried to get up. But as soon as I heard the engine go away from the area, you know, I immediately got up and I walked over to the sidewalk that was there. And I said to this guy who was walking his dog, do you see what just happened to me? And he didn't know, <laughs> I don't think he comprehended. But then I immediately dialed 911. And then the Las Vegas Police Department, a patrol car came over. And then the next day they brought me these um, scrapbook full of pictures. And I immediately identified the assailant. There he was. And um, well, I have a question for them next week, is why the hell don't you, uh, arrest this guy again, because he's already in a head of mugshot, and find out, you know, what they, what they do with David Lifton's car, you know, because <laughs> I don't have wheels right now, and I'm, I, you know, I don't want to start to try to buy a car if I don't have to buy a car. On the other hand, maybe these guys stripped it of all its parts. I don't know what they did with it. The officer tried to say, oh, they just wanted to go joyriding. I don't think so, because I did some internet research, and there have been other, what they call parking lot carjacks in the area. Mm. So this is not new to this area. Mm. So these guys case the area, the cars to them, these cars lined up as hundreds of cars, you know, around the residential uh, complex. And mm. it's like an open jewelry box. That's what it is. It's like an open jewelry box. So these guys have to have cameras in there or these, or people like this just come in and they're going to uh, rob it. It was only 10 o'clock, 10, 1040 at night. And then the police were there very quickly, but or police car. But what could they do? 
you know, I don't know what, the, what they're going to do about this. I hope it gets resolved. Um, well, I'm, you know, thank God you're okay. You can continue that, that all important research. And um, like I said, if any of the viewers out there would like to contribute to your GoFundMe, I'm going to put the link down below and uh, it'd be greatly appreciated. Uh, I'd like to say, you know, for me, I'm, you know, in my mid fifties, I really appreciate, you know, you've devoted your whole life to this. And if it wasn't for you and some of these other people, you know, we would not know, uh, you know, anything really about Kennedy's assassination. And as I was, when I was in high school, just assume all oh, Oswald shot Kennedy end of story Correct. more mm -hmm. than that. So I appreciate from the bottom of my heart, what, you know, what you've done because you know, I can imagine you've made a lot of sacrifices to do this research and the right best evidence. And you're now in the process of trying to wrap up uh, Final Charade. And um, as I said, as Robbie said, my buddy Robbie and I, when we interviewed you, we can't wait to read that book. So, uh, you know, anyways, would you have, do you have anything you'd like to add to say to the audience or just in anything? Well, I don't know. I think the thing I like to say to the audience is that when President Kennedy visited Dallas on November 22nd, 63, and as he was walking down the steps with Jackie from the rear part of the plane and to the, you know, the roaring crowd that was there to greet him, that in that crowd and, and, and on his Secret Service detail were people who were prepared to murder him and, and who were involved in the original crime. And to them, you know, Kennedy was misrepresented and misunderstood to be someone who was selling out the country, doing bad things. You know, the, the crime was probably pitched on the idea that he wanted a, you know, a treaty with the Soviet Union, that he was a traitor. All this garbage, mm -hmm. you know, that's believed by, by these extremists on the right. And, and therefore, they approach this as something that, that, that was a good thing to do, important because Kennedy was a communist, a secret communist. That's a bunch of garbage and it's junk and it comes from ignorant people. Mm -hmm. But anyway, but, the, but, but the, the thing they were dealing with in, in arranging his murder was a very, very clever modus operandi, mm -hmm. which comes from the highest levels of intelligence. I'm sure. I mean, who the heck ever thinks of falsifying a body to conceal the murder? I mean, if, in, in history, I know of one case where they falsified a body in World War II and floated a, floated it ashore in Spain right. to, to mislead the, the Nazis as to where the, the D-Day invasion would occur. Yes. I mean, that's the closest I know. But anyway, so in that group at the airport and some of those agents, and I've spoken to some of those agents, and I have my own beliefs about who was involved in this. And most of them have passed away. Luckily, I'm living at 81. And of course, I want to finish Final Charade. But but, and, but if you listen to the Dallas police radio transmissions, which I have studied very carefully, there's a tremendous drama about it to me because you hear this crime and stuff. I mean, after all, they've arranged for Oswald, the man who lived in the Soviet Union for two and a half years to be in Dealey Plaza in the building. This whole thing has been arranged. They invited Kennedy. Kennedy was invited to Dallas. Then are you going to have a motorcade? Yes, he wants a motorcade. The whole thing was arranged. So it's, it's a, it's a crime with a built-in cover-up is what I'm saying. And it was planned from the outset to falsify the evidence and sell this false story to the American public. And if you want to see how that's done, you need the original UPI and AP dispatches, just as they rolled off the ticker. And I have them. And you see how it worked. And, and that some of the mystery is removed. But you realize that during Kennedy's thousand days, when he was planning to have peace with Russia and not have a nuclear war, these people were planning to kill him. I mean, it's really amazing. And his whole life was devoted at that time to making sure that we don't have a nuclear war and we get, and, and he succeeded. No nuclear war, peace treaty with, you know, the nuclear track with Russia, avoiding nuclear war in the, in the um, Caribbean in October 62, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Mm -hmm. But these guys, they also were carrying briefcases and they also had papers and they're planning how to get rid of President Kennedy and make Lyndon Johnson the president. I mean, that's kind of a historical synopsis of what's going on here. I, you know, you mentioned in military intelligence and it definitely sounds like a, an intelligence operation without a doubt to me anyways. Yes. And I had a student when I was at Wabonzi Valley High School where I used to give those presentations 
he had an uncle, and I remember the kid's name, Jason. I won't use his last name. He said one day he came up to me and he said, um, my uncle works in the Pentagon in, in the black ops, whatever mm. that's called. I said, really? <clears throat> and he said, yeah. And he told me this story. And he said when he was at, in the early to mid 60s, it was after Kennedy had been killed. My uncle told me he went into the cafeteria, whatever, there's probably several in the, in the Pentagon. He said he, he sat down and it was all this brass all everywhere. Yeah. You know, Admiral, general, whatever. And, and you have to know this kid. He was a card. He was a, he was a, he was a clown. And I can imagine his uncle was the same way. And his, and he just said out loud, so who shot Kennedy anyways? And, and he said, you could hear a pin drop and all these brass <laughs> stared at him with the death stare. Yeah. And he said, I never brought up the subject again. <laughs> so, well, I will, I, I like to say, that's very really interesting. I'd like to say again that another conclusion I have come to is that this was primarily a Dallas plot. I mean, it's Dallas officials who are involved, the Dallas police chief, the Dallas deputy chief, um, it's and certain people at Parkland Hospital. In other words, you could not have done this scheme in Boston and Cambridge, where Kennedy was much beloved, or in New York City. It's not going to happen. The climate in Dallas, William Manchester, although he had the wrong particulars completely, was correct about the Dallas climate being hate-filled. If you pump all this poison into the, you know, it was, I think it was pretty easy to recruit for this plot mm -hmm. because Kennedy, the population at large had been sold as bill of goods that Kennedy was this terrible person. Well, he wasn't. It was, that, that was right. just not the truth at all. Most of these folks were alive because Kennedy avoided a nuclear war during his thousand days. And that's something that's generally appreciated. When you look in the rearview mirror to history, until this crime is resolved, the nation cannot get back to what it, to what it originally was. Mm -hmm. It really can't. Because all these, I mean, we could go through the Johnson and Mr. You can't study the Johnson years without realizing that the war was escalated suddenly mm -hmm. within a year. And Kennedy had no intention of going into Vietnam like that. And then you go down the presidents one after another after another. But I'm not saying any of those guys, the subsequent presidents, were involved in any kind of a cover-up. I'm just no. saying no. the foundation of this building called uh, our history or our government has been um, 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 soiled with yeah. this false history. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's illusory. It's not the truth about what happened. When this is solved, we can maybe get back to the business of telling the truth, because then we'll have a genuine history, even though it'll have a very dark spot in Dallas. So I'm going to throw this at you. I know you don't agree with me, but I believe his, the, the, that Kennedy's uh, uh, burial vault is empty. What do you think about that? Um, no, I believe it contains the altered body of Kennedy, just as it was p placed in there uh, at his funeral on November 25, uh, 1963. Mm -hmm. I don't see any, in other words, the crime, the deception occurs by altering the body, which then can be examined, buried, whatever. Uh, it's not necessary to rob the body a second time. It's already been altered. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. the, the, the evidence has been altered once that autopsy is finished at just, the Cesar on the night of 11-22. I just feel like, if they were to get rid of the body, then they could always, like the brain disappeared. They could say, the brain did disappear. what happened? Oh, wow. Well, <laughs> we'll never know now, you know. And well, maybe we, they buried him at sea or something. I don't know. No, but, no, the, well, no, no. I think he's, he's, his altered body is, look, the Kennedy case, this will never happen. He will never be um, exhumed in my lifetime, if ever. But if they did exhume him, they would find the body that was, reassembled and put together wow. at the end of the false autopsy on the night of November 22nd. Wow. That, that's the crime. The crime is altering the body before the autopsy. And then for the photographs, doing some monkey business at the back of the head, mm -hmm. you know, to make it appear that, um, so they can photograph it and call these the autopsy photographs. Yeah. yeah. But, but that's the body that's buried there. Thank you very much, David Lifton. I appreciate it. And uh, you know, thank you. Take recover quickly. Yes. Looking for, please finish uh, Final Charade. I want to read that book. Oh, I'm finishing it all right. So, so 
Um, what about now? Now, when I look at my notes, uh, you're fine. Don't don't worry about that. You can see me and hear me. Yeah, don't worry about any of that. Okay. Um, you know, it's not like we're trying to uh, do a teaser reel or something for Hollywood. You know? <laughs>